It sounds so basic. It's like we can't change everything all at one time. And then we have these habits that are, and behaviors that are dominoes for things in our lives that if we just focus on a couple things and do those really well, the journey will begin to unfold. The path will begin to lay itself. But when we get started on these journeys, we're like, I've got to change every single thing. And for a lot of people, they're either cohabitating with roommates, they live with a family, you know, they're not just in that bubble. And so how do you navigate that space? I still think there should be an aspect of like, I'm invested in this process. I'm open. I'm curious. I want to experiment with this or check this out. And if you're not in that space, I don't know if you're ready, you know, to have at least a little bit of curiosity and openness. Like, it's okay to have it not be the, the right time. On the flip side, if you've been saying that for like the last eight years and you just are having resistance, like find someone who can work with you. That's Steph Godro, and this is episode 217 of Wellness Force Radio. What's up, my friend? It's your host, Josh Trent, and welcome back to another episode for your weekly access to global experts in all things wellness as we discover the physical and emotional intelligence we need to live life well. In this episode, I got to sit down with my friend and powerhouse podcaster, health and fitness influencer, and best-selling author, Steph Godro. This episode brings up a lot of questions for all of us who care about wellness in this very exciting and also challenging time in human evolution. And the question is, with the growth of women's empowerment and the ripple effect of older forms of patriarchy still being felt in the waters of our existence, what does the dance between men and women look like now? not only in dating, but in cultivating inner strength while respecting and honoring one another's differences. Many people know Steph as the creator of Stupid Easy Paleo, a world-renowned expert on how to build unbreakable humans with her podcast Harder to Kill and her Women's Strength Summit. But what's most fascinating, I know you're going to get a kick out of this podcast, is that I got to record live and in person with her cat walking around in her sunlit living room next to the green garden where she grows her vegetables. For a person who's constantly sharing so much of her heart and soul online, She's actually an introvert, and I think what you're going to find interesting about what you get out of the episode beyond the powerful takeaways about building internal and external strength, how to navigate the hashtag MeToo movement, and why Steph is choosing to pivot at this stage in her game as a creator, but most importantly, how Steph's lessons around reframing situations, proper communication, and setting healthy boundaries will give you the unique tools to transform your life. Now, part of being harder to kill is having great posture. We talked about breathing from the diaphragm so much on the show, and I'm excited to bring you this podcast in partnership with Dr. Tim Brown and IntelliSkin, the creators of human technology, Smart Compression, which is an apparel top made of cutting-edge materials, clinically proven to improve posture and alignment. This posture cue tech that actually works with your own body to create awareness of improved posture throughout the entire day. So if you're swinging a kettlebell or lifting with a barbell or even standing at the standing desk or sitting down, this tactile response uses the thousands of nerve bundles on top of your skin to gently pull your shoulders back all day long. So you can have great posture. All you have to do is go over to IntelliSkin.net and enter code WF20. They gave you the hookup, 20% off a test drive of your new smart compression, give it a go. Intelliskin.net, enter code WF20 today. And today coming up right now on the podcast from San Diego, we're talking about Steph's road of body image in an industry that praises perfection. How to find a gym where you feel comfortable, the biggest limiting beliefs around women and lifting weights, how Steph honors both her strong, confident self and a highly sensitive personality. And we talked about everything from nutrition, pre and post workout to her upcoming book. Share this podcast with a man or woman who's interested in these topics. You will make their day and you will help other physically and emotionally intelligent people like you find the show. Now let's drop in live and in person with Steph Godreau. You know, you were one of these people that like when I first started, uh, I saw you having massive success and I was just so genuinely excited because there's so many fakers out there. Uh, and, and I've come across this so much lately, actually, like as the podcast has grown stuff, I've been like, um, almost experiencing disposable hero syndrome where I'm realizing like I'm interviewing some of these people with amazing followings. And then when the camera turns off, it's like, they're nothing I thought they'd be. Do you feel like this mm. sometimes? You know, they say, don't meet your hero. <laughs> um, it, I, The interesting thing is the more I'm in this world of online marketing, and obviously when you're online, you don't necessarily always see what somebody's like in person. Oftentimes people have big teams behind them. Yeah. 
sometimes they're very sort of behind they're they're almost more behind the scenes than their team is in terms of the day-to-day stuff and I think the more I do this so this is five years now that I've been working for myself the longer I do this the longer I'm just like things aren't always what they seem you know take it as take take everybody else's perceived success with a grain of salt and understand that people are coming from vastly different places I mean, even sometimes people that you see that have success in a particular niche or market, it may be their fourth or fifth iteration of what their business is or, you know, they may, um, my favorite thing is, you know, like, and money is my biggest hang up um, that I'm still working through. That's one of mine too. (laughs) Because I grew Mm. up that way, you know, Mm. we didn't have money as a kid, as kids, like it was always very thrifty, very frugal, like we don't have money for this and that. And anyway, you know, I will see all of these things like have a seven figure launch or whatever it is, like a lot of stuff that's marketed toward entrepreneurs. And I'm kind of like, okay, I get it. But how much money did you actually take home? I mean, what's the measure of success here? Is the measure of success how much money you grossed, how much money you took home? Is it your quality of life at the end of the day? (laughs) You know, how much has your health suffered? yeah, Yeah. And I think that's a huge thing that not a lot of people talk about in this in this area this is like online world is yeah. what is it costing you and i say this to my to my clients and the folks that i coach all the time they always want to know you know they just sometimes they just want answers they just want permission and so sometimes it's like um is this the right thing for me to do what should i do and i'm like i don't know how like is it worth what it's costing you is it giving you more than it's yeah. taking away yeah. And to me, that's the best heuristic for people to self-reflect. What am I doing? Because there's always a cost. There's a cost benefit to everything, right? There's positive consequences. There's negative consequences. And when we can get people to, to become proficient at assessing this for themselves, they're able to have more autonomous decisions and really stay true to what's important to them rather than looking out into the world for, and I'm not saying like coaches are great. Every, I think, you know, I have coaches, I've had coaches. Um, I think do you have coaches, a coach right now. I do not have a coach at this very present moment. I transitioned out of working with my old coaches. I do work with somebody now who's kind of a de facto coach for me. Uh-huh. Um, even though she's more of a consultant, but we've sort of taken on this uh, coach client relationship in a lot of ways. And I think it's really important at times in your life to have, that objective view had somebody to be reflecting things back at you to suggest things that you hadn't thought of before. But when it comes down to it, even a, a coach can't necessarily assess exactly is this thing right for you in your life right now. Yeah. And so I, I try to default to that a lot and suggest that people think about that. And so that, that guides me with a lot of like, am I successful? What does that mean to me? Um, what is it costing me if I'm sort of working toward a new project or like pushing things to the next level? Am I, do I still have quality of life? Am I still able to enjoy myself now? What's that like? And what's the cost to benefit ratio if you don't change? Because there was right. a huge part of your life where you're like, I kind of want to change, but I'm not exactly sure. Like, what's the threshold to get mm-hmm. there? Uh, three years ago, we interviewed episode 16, which is blowing my mind. Right now. <laughs> it's actually surreal to be in your home. So thank you for having me. I got to meet your cat, Ellie. Yeah. Like, this has been so cool so far. And <laughs> I'm thinking about like, when I started, I actually was just moving through fear. But when you started, you were actually letting go of a teaching gig. Uh, A lot of people Mm -hmm. don't know that about you, especially if they don't know anything about you, that Mm -hmm. you're a teacher. Like that's kind of always been in your genetics. Uh, What have you learned personally in the last three years since you started the podcast? I think we kind of started almost at the same time. Like so many people have heard your voice now, but what, what have you learned about Steph since you started? Oh man. I mean, to me, it's like a continuous peeling back of layers. And a lot of the things that I've come up against professionally and personally in the last three years have been this sort of, you know, when I left the classroom in 2013, so it's been five years, it's been about five years since I launched the podcast as well, or three years since I launched the podcast. Those first two years of self-employment, doing my own thing, were just sort of getting my feet under me. And I felt a lot of pressure. It was probably very self-generated, but I felt a lot of pressure to sort of grow and get the numbers and 
you know, uh, get as many people in my community as I could. And, you know, it's all about metrics and it's all about that sort of like how I perceived that I would know if I was moving in the right direction. And it's interesting because when I left the classroom and started doing stupid easy paleo full time, I felt sort of like, okay, well, I've got to grow this thing. Um, I've got to sort of do all the things that I've been, t- been told are going to help me be successful. And I lost my voice in that process quite a bit. And so I started focusing a lot on, you know, the recipes and the, and I love all that stuff still. I, I think food is the gateway drug to better health food and fitness for a yeah. lot of people. Mm-hmm. Like food is very approachable for a lot of folks. It's like something we all have to do. We don't all have to go exercise if we don't really want to. I mean, I think we should be exploring movement in whatever way makes sense to us, but we all, we've all got to eat. And so yeah. that's a very approachable place for people. And that became a way for me to try to cultivate this business, right, around food and, and all of that stuff. And I feel like I said, I lost my voice along that path in the first couple of years. And I would say, you know, the first year of the podcast, it was still kind of in that transitional phase. Obviously, I was getting on and interviewing a lot of people, yourself included, which, Mm -hmm. you know. One of the early ones. (laughs) One of the early ones, you know. um, And that's really, that was really, I think, kind of the the way for me to start exploring that voice. But about two and a half years ago, I started feeling really like, oh, I don't know. Like, is this what I want to do? Um really starting to feel like I wanted to return to having my voice be more central to what I do. And like food is a part of it, but I actually started a new website, a different website. I was like, I just need a new space. I just need a a different spot. I need to just be me. Yeah. And I did that for about a year. So I launched a new website And then I ran up against this conundrum where I would write content, I would write pieces, and I would kind of freak out like, where is this, what, which site does this live on? I want everybody to hear this. What was the new name of the site? So the the new site that I launched was stephgaudreau.com. So just my name. Okay, so it's you, yeah. It was me. Mm -hmm. Um, And it actually is still alive. And um, this is the site we're rebranding to later this year and completely redirecting everything. But I, you know, I felt like I was running two different, I was running two websites, two social, two sets of social accounts. And I, you know, I am the child of divorced parents. And I felt very much like, uh, a person that was sort of like, whose house am I sleeping at this weekend? You know, it was very like, where do I go? Where's the headquarters? Where's the home? And when you feel like you don't have a home, how can you be, you know, um, feel safe and comfortable and protected and and like you have a spot to launch that creativity from? So I did that for a year and completely kind of burnt out and was like, you know what? I can't do both of these. This is killing me. So I'm going to go back to Stupid Easy Paleo. I'm just going to write about whatever I want there. I'm going to make that the home base. And so I've been doing that for the last year and a half. But again, still have run into this. Like, it's just time to move on. It's time to Mm. change things up. And yes, again, food is part of it. But to me, that wellness, that health, that health-seeking journey that so many people are on, we have to pay homage to the diversity of things that go into that for any particular person. And yes, it may start with food. Um, it may start with exercise, but at the longer people are in this journey, they're like, that's the support. That's the the foundation, but there's so much more. Yeah. And, and also the, this idea of personalized nutrition is very important to me. Now I'm in school to be a nutritional therapist. Um, I've changed my views quite a bit on like, yes, uh, paleo is like an on-ramp. It's not the only on-ramp. Eventually we need to, again, we need to consider the individual, their unique bio-individuality, what's, you know, what their goals are. We need to tailor things for them. And so I kept running up against this song, this same song and dance of like, potatoes aren't paleo. And I'm like, 
oh my gosh, you guys, can we just move <laughs> past this? Like, you know, green beans are a legume. They aren't paleo. And I'm like, yeah. holy shit. Well, do you feel like at this stage of your game that the word paleo even rings just as true as it did in the beginning? Has it lost its luster? Um, it means so many different things now to a lot of people. That yeah. being said, caveat, you know, I think the ancestral sort of model for approaching nutrition was always like that. And somewhere along the way, it became something that meant a very strict dogmatic rule list of rules and yes and no foods. And like, uh, how is that any better than, you know, we're all going to be low fat. We're all going to be, you know, we're going to be super dogmatic about what we do. And the more I go through this, I'm just like, can we, I get it. Labels help people navigate the world, but at a, at a certain point, labels become constricting and they don't necessarily serve the greater purpose. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of what I do, a lot of how we eat is still along the, that paleo framework. I just, um, I'm just tired of arguing with people about what isn't, isn't yeah. paleo. And I'm like, but what works for you? Well, and you've, you've been a teacher for the most, for the biggest portion of your life. Mm-hmm. You've been instructing and teaching. Um, what even got you into teaching in the first place? I'm curious about that. Cause oh your gosh. parents were like very work ethic. They weren't entrepreneurial, right? Your no. parents. Um, I'm always curious about people's past because it really like shapes how I see them through a lens in the future, mm. right? So like where you're going now with this new version of yourself, it's got to be scary. And then why did you actually get into yeah. teaching in the first place? Yeah, that's a really good question. And uh, so a lot of people, I, I've only re- recently kind of started talking about this publicly in the last probably year or two, um, is that I've been married three times. I'm married to my third husband now. Um, I was I got married really young for the first time at 21. Um and then I got married again when I was in my late 20s. And I got involved in a relationship with my first husband when I was still in college. And for the longest time, I wanted to be a doctor. That was like my thing. I was like, I want to be a doctor. I used to watch surgery shows on TLC. Why do you want to be a doctor? I don't know. Just something about it. Just something I always loved uh, the human body. I always thought it was so fascinating how we work. Uh, how, I'm still fascinated yeah, by it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, what, like I said, I would watch like the, the surgical shows on TLC, like people getting knee replacements and weird stuff like that when uh, other kids are off doing other things and just always was super fascinated by nature. My grandfather, my maternal grandfather was um, very uh, important in my life. He was like my father. Mm. Uh, he died when I was eight. And those er- early formative years with him, though, he was very much... He introduced my sister and I to things in nature and I I just like I always because of him I really believe I that's what planted the seed of being curious and interested about science and the natural world and you know human body and all these things so I think that was a, a huge part of it that ignition was there for me at a very early age I studied lots of sciences in high school went to college and I actually started off college as a physical therapy major at a college that was very close to my high school, a uh, very competitive program at Springfield College, very small program. And I got in and I did a like a an observation rotation at an outpatient PT place. And I was like, I don't want to do this. <laughs> um, this just isn't what I'm really interested in. Yeah. So then I transferred schools, went to UMass Amherst uh, in the biology department. And while I was there, I was working at a grocery store that I had worked at since I was in high school and was decorating cakes. So that's a skill that a lot of people know I have. And I, while I was working there, met my then future first husband. And he was older, a little bit older than me. And I just gave up a lot of my ambition because I wanted to be with him. And so I changed my, you know, I was like, okay, I'll be pre-med And when I started getting involved with him and was in a relationship and we got engaged, um, you know, and I I was like 20 years old. Yeah. Um, I'm 39 now. So I'm like, what are you doing, child? (laughs) You know? (laughs) Um, But I decided that I didn't want to pursue the the medical track because then what would that mean for our relationship? And, you know, this is very, this is a very common story along my life is um, giving up things that were really important to me, sacrificing those things. And you could say, well, there is compromise in any relationship, but I've, looking back at myself, especially when I was a lot younger, I think for me, abandonment is a big part of 
the things I'm afraid of. Yep. And so I was like, well, I don't want to lose this relationship. And so what am I going to do? I'm going to actually change what I'm studying. And so I didn't really want to go into research. A lot of people that I knew in, in my department were going into research and working in labs. And I was like, I, the idea of looking at a microscope all day just doesn't appeal. Um, you know, working at a bench and pipetting things. And yeah. um, I wasn't going to go to the pre-med, pre-med track. And so I thought, well, what is there for me that I could do? And a friend told me about, you know, they're like, why don't you, you know, check out teaching? You could teach science. Oh, this was a suggestion from a friend. I mean, there were sort of like three options you could go, yeah. you could go down. But yeah, that was one that was sort of like floated my way. And I was like, yeah, you know what? I always loved school. Turns out being a great student doesn't always make you a great teacher. Um, I struggled a lot, especially in those early years. And I taught for 12 years, but I struggled a lot in those early years with finding uh, empathy and relating to my students who struggled in school. Because I was always like the teacher's pet. I mean, gold stars. Were these low-income kids or were they just normal kind of economic level? Um, no, I mean, when I worked here in, in Southern California in, in Chula Vista, the first school that I taught at was, you know, we had 50% of our students were on free and re- 60% were on free and reduced lunch. Yeah. Um, definitely worked in a food desert. Special like, lunch line. I remember that. I was raised on welfare. Yeah. Same thing. Mm-hmm. We had tokens, you know, when we were growing mm-hmm. up. So that, um, yeah, I don't know. I just, that I struggled a lot in the early years to find, like I said, empathy and relating to my students who were like, screw school, man. Like I'm just getting through this. And now being an entrepreneur and seeing like, okay, I punched my ticket. I got all, you know, good grades. And like, I loved school and I loved, I loved my teachers and I loved, I loved the attention that I got from being a performing, high performing student that fed a lot of my perfectionism. And, you know, Mm -hmm. that goes deep into a lot of different things. But for me, looking back, I'm like, and now as an entrepreneur and somebody who works for myself and I'm my own boss, I think about those kids who are kind of like, eh, school. My husband is is sort of one of those who just didn't do great in school. And I think he's brilliant in so many ways. Um, I sort of think back to those kids and I'm like, man, you have you have a zone of genius. We just got to find a way. got to channel it correctly. Find a way for you to be able to <laughs> express that. So yeah, that was a really long-winded way of me sort of explaining yeah. that. But, you know, I I don't know. I actually later on went, ended up going back and taking the GMAT and – uh, did pretty well, but I just never pursued that. My uncle was a, a pediatrician for his whole life, and he just retired a year or two ago. And I remember thinking, Uncle Eric is almost never around on holidays. He's <laughs> always on call. Yeah. Like, do I want to do that either? And so I don't know. I think I've ended up in a good spot. But those that early decision was very much motivated by wanting to not up in the apple cart of my relationship that I was in at the time. And it's so challenging too, because you, you told me before we recorded, like you're an introvert, like that's kind of your default. So somebody that now like it's lights, camera, action all the time, mm-hmm. you know, whether it's social or, or being on a podcast, it's like, that's got to be an edge that you're constantly leaning into. Mm-hmm. This edge of like taking your introvertism, still respecting that, mm-hmm. but then growing the other part of you that really gets to be seen, this being seen part. And I feel like that's actually why, you know, helping women build stronger bodies and minds and own their power. Mm-hmm. That's that's what this is really about. I'm almost getting this flash for you. Like early in your life at 21, you're like, oh, I'm going to dim my light and kind of go and, and mm. lessen my power for him. And now you're actually finding that power again at this age and helping other women do the same. I mean, Absolutely. that's fascinating. Yeah. And when, when my second marriage was ending, there was, re- this was, this predated my leaving the classroom by a little bit. And it was right around that time where I realized I, I don't think I want to be in the classroom anymore. There's something else for me. I don't know what it is. And that was a very much another sort of confronting time where it was like, how am I going to navigate this? Like there, we have a life, we have a house, we've got all these things. And um, how do I operate in this new construct that I feel like I I don't want to be in this spot? And so I feel like that was sort of a, like a really tumultuous time for a lot of reasons, but it, it was definitely a, I feel like there's huge amounts of growing pains and I don't know how to deal with it. And now I'm like, just like, let's just do this. I'm just tired of waiting around. Yeah. 
<laughs> and at that time, though, January 2010, no culinary training, uh, you know, 2013, flash forward, you're in the middle of a divorce. Mm-hmm. When did you actually leave teaching and then go into being a voice for paleo? Yeah. Did you take like one step and fall and then get to the ledge or did you jump right over to the ledge? I started the website in September of 2011. I had been blogging previous to that though, probably about 2009. I wish that blog still existed. What was the name of it? Um, my original blog was just my married name at the time. And it was a, it was truly just a place I would write about mountain biking and I would take my little camera with me and, you know, take pictures and write about the places that I rode. Mountain biking's no joke. Yeah, I did. I, that's what I did for eight years before I, you know, started strength training. Yeah. And uh, I would write recipes. I've always loved to cook. Um, I would write recipes and I put them on this personal website. And again, somebody was like, you should start a food blog. Okay. <laughs> so I Were started, you like, what's a food blog? I was sort of like, I don't know the first thing about food blogging. Yeah. I've got a blog. Okay. That can be very different. So I started putting recipes on this new, I bought a domain, bought Stupid Easy Paleo and started putting recipes on there. And uh, I did that for you know, a, um, but basically a year and a half. And when I finally left the class- classroom in June of 2013, that's when I transitioned to doing that full time. And you look back and I look back and sort of like a year and a half, that's not very long to sort of go all in. Luckily, I was able to take a leave of absence from my district. I put in for that leave and I said, and my principal at the time, I think he was bluffing me, but he said, you know, they're only approving leave of absence for pregnancy, but you can try. And I was like, well, I'm going to try. Yeah. And so I, I appealed for a leave and uh, I said, look, I have this thing I want to do. I think it's really important. We're always telling our students to follow their dreams and I want to try something new. And they gave me the leave of absence. So I didn't have to quit outright. I think had I had to quit outright, that would have been a huge, I would have felt like I was under a ton more pressure. But with the leave, it was unpaid, but I could come back in a year. They would hold my position for me. So during that first year, I just remember, okay, sink or swim. And that's really when I had to jump off the cliff. Yeah. And then you bought Paleo Comfort Foods was your first book, right? Uh, No, Stupid Easy Paleo was the first book. And that came out 2015. No, that you actually bought to to learn from. Yeah. 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 Very early on in, in sort of me going paleo, which started in 2010, there were like two books at the time. Paleo Comfort Foods, Charles and like Charles book. Charles and Julie Mayfield, and um, Paleo, uh, Make It Paleo by Bill and Haley Staley, and so those were the two books that I had very early on in in sort of this new way of eating that that inspired me. But there wasn't a ton, there weren't a ton of people who were blogging about this and doing this sort of thing, and so it felt yeah. very brave new world and and very uh, much like the Wild West in a lot of ways. But yeah, that's that was sort of the so I had been doing it for about a year and a half by the time I left the classroom and thought, all right, well, and we're gonna we're gonna see how this goes. But it was scary. Even that that year leave of absence yep. was scary. I moved to Scotland for four months, came back here. You know, it was just there was a lot of transitions. Steph, going on. let's talk about the money part because that's one of, still one of my biggest triggers, actually. And you know, I'm, I'm a 38 year old man, and I'm constantly <laughs> looking at like, okay, can I be aware of the story that that younger version of myself mm-hmm. continues to speak? And I think about money for most people. Like you were raised uh, for some time by a single mom. I can totally relate to this. Mm-hmm. Um, a big one because it's like unless we have money and resources, then we're really not satisfying the bottom of the triangle that Maslow talks about, right? So if we don't take care of safety, if we don't care, take care of like structure around us it's really hard to have space mm-hmm. to live a life of wellness. Yeah. How did you work through that? How are you continuing Gosh, to work through that? <laughs> like I said earlier, I think this is one of my biggest uh, upper limit problems that I have, which is this uh, fear of wealth, um, not knowing how to handle those, not just the the physical, like, I go to my bank account and I see I have this much money, but what that means about me as a person and growing up, um, I, I grew up very much, um, you know, blue collar. My mom was a waitress for a really long time. And then when she married my stepdad and they had two more kids, she stayed home and took care of the kids. So we were six people living on a uh, truck driver's income. And, and this is in Western Mass and, you know, it it was just a very, I just remember this narrative of like, we don't have money for that. There's not money for that. We need to buy. I remember, you know, having long hair. I have long hair now too, but um, getting, you know, my parents were like, well, if you want a better shampoo, 
because we would get white rain. White rain was the oh, and suave. Yeah, yeah white rain yeah. was the was the shampoo. <laughs> and they were like, if you want something other than white rain, you got to save up your money. You know, save up your allowance or whatever it was. And yeah. uh, I just growing up, that was always a thing. Like there wasn't enough money. We, you know, we would take like one nice vacation a year. I never felt like I was truly lacking growing up. I mean, I went to private school, um, Catholic school. Oh, like my cousins, I remember though, like they're, they always had like really super nice, they would go to Disney World and like Hawaii and we would go to Maine. You know, this is growing up in Massachusetts and yeah. stuff. And so, uh, you know, they would learn, they were learning to ski and we would take the tubes to the local golf course and sled down Franconia golf course on the, you know, on the hill in the winter. And like, that was the sort of like disparity that I saw. And so I think for me, Growing up, money was always like a they have it and I and we don't, and like what is the deal with rich people? They're all assholes. Did you feel like it was a sentence? Like this is going to be for my whole life. That's going to be the meaning. I just feel like that was just it's just what it was, and so you know, growing up, um, when I went to college, I got some scholarships. I worked to afford the rest of my college education. So I was working part-time in the bakery, make decorating cakes and stuff like that and paid off my college. And, um, you know, it was, I don't, in a lot of ways, like I don't uh, fault my, my upbringing. I mean, I learned the value of hard work and what things meant and in a way like minimalism and being frugal. And I think those are all very good qualities. But it was almost like, you know, what that meant to me. And and so now, even still today, this is something I struggle with with my business too, is like that feeling of either I want to hire someone to help me um, grow and I can't do everything. And I am used to when I started, I was bootstrapping everything I did Everything. You were writing the code yourself. You were doing the splash pages. Oh, like- I know how to. I know how to edit CSS and like <laughs> a million things I never thought I would know how to do. Like, I can. I'm a, the jack of all trades. Uh, if it's if it's very high level advanced, probably not. But I learned how to do everything, and so that has been a process of like untangling that as well. But if I'm going to hire somebody now, I'm like, okay, now I'm responsible for being able to bring in the income to pay them because then they're going to be depending on that. I want to make sure that I'm growing in a way that is very aligned to my purpose and my mission. And I don't want to just have, like, I don't want to be a manager of like 30 people. Yeah, Um, It's just not what I feel like I'm here to do. On the flip side of that, I know that unless I, I delegate more things and I'm, I've, I'm probably the world's slowest delegator and I've started to do this and like hire people and, um, you know, do things like take things off my plate, but it's been, it has been a process and it has been very wrought with uh, just pain and like anxiety and, oh, are we going to end up broke? And, you know, it's, it's a crazy, like taxes, tax season comes around and I'm like, you know, and I have an accountant and like all the, uh, all my ducks are in that row. And I still like the first quarter of every year, I just feel this impending doom about money. And yeah. and so, yeah, I mean, it's something I continue to kind of work through, but I don't know. Um, I don't know how I, I'm going to get 100% past it. I know people have money coaches and like yeah. books about it. Money and- belief and, and money's just energy and we know that. And I think the logical mind accepts that on some level. <laughs> like, okay, we know that money's just energy, mm-hmm. yet the imprinting still remains. Yeah. And so that's what we're working through. And I found that like a lot of creators like yourself that are powerful, that are leading people, you have this great responsibility mm-hmm. because if you're being authentic and honest about truly what you're going through, you're going to give them permission to explore the same damn thing. And like, mm-hmm. that's what I've always felt from you. And it, that's been cool to get to know you in that regard, because I'm thinking like how many people out there right now are saying one thing, but then like behind the scenes, mm. they're doing another. Mm-hmm. And we don't have to name names. This isn't, so, I'm not trying to be like controversial here, but how do people trust? Like, is it just a feeling they have when they're looking at an influencer or like, what's the barometer for bullshit? <laughs> oh, I, I feel like it's sort of how honest do you want to be with yourself about why you're following that person? Um, I think that's a pretty good test, a pretty good barometer. Like, am I following this person because it's coming from a place of love and uh, exploration and curiosity about myself yeah. and what I 
see reflected in them could be what I see reflected in me and what am I open to learning about and you know what am I going to get emotional and triggered from and you know understanding where that presents an opportunity to learn more things but I think you know if you're following somebody because it's like the hate follow you know like hate following is a thing like I hate this person and I hate the way they make me feel but I'm going to follow them anyway because I just want to hate them for what they are and I, I, I think it comes down to those two things. Are you following someone, you know, are they, and I, Angie Alt, who's uh, one of the, you know, her and um, Mickey Trescott are the autoimmune wellness, leaders of the autoimmune wellness community, autoimmune paleo. Uh, Angie had a brilliant post on Instagram yesterday. It was like, what's the difference between, between a leader and an influencer? It's a great question. And um she, you know, defined it in multiple ways, but I think that's ultimately that's the the barometer for bullshit is like, are you following somebody because they you feel you can trust them as a leader, or are they just influencing you to buy things or um you know, uh follow their exact their exact path, or are they challenging you to follow your best path? And I think that's a huge difference. But, you know, ultimately for me, it comes down to like, am I following this person because they're inspiring me to be my best self or because, um, you know, I feel like a lack of and I want to just get to where they are and I just want to be like them. So when people are always like, sometimes I'll post pictures of myself squatting or whatever. And I get a lot of people who say like hashtag body goals. And I'm like, no, 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 no. This is my body. <laughs> Have your own, like, don't want my body yeah. because your body may never look like my body. Just be strong and comfortable in your body, how it makes sense for you. And I get it. Like, I get why people do that. And I feel very, like, I feel very flattered, but I also feel like a huge responsibility, like you said, yeah. to be like, wait a second. <laughs> We're going to post this in the show notes. You know? you, you, a couple days ago, you posted something on Facebook. Let's talk about cellulite. Oh, yeah. Uh, holy shnikes. Yeah. Like when I look in the mirror still, I'm like, okay, I'm going to change this thing. And I'm constantly breathing between self-judgment, self-love, and just accepting what is. I'm always rotating between those mm -hmm. three. And in your post, you talked about this. It's like, how do we actually give ourselves the permission to accept the body exactly how it is, knowing that that's all the power that we'll get to change it from. Mm -hmm. The other way, if we're angry at how the body is, then we're just stuck in that cycle. How do you shift out of that cycle of hate and mm. get into the one where you're like, I love myself and I'm perfectly imperfect right now? Um, so body, I will say this, body positivity, I think has been a, a great movement for a lot of people for a lot of reasons. Um, this idea of uh, making health and wellness more inclusive, showing different bodies, making non-traditional body types not only okay, but the norm, right? I think all of that has been fantastic. However, and I, I've talked about this before on Instagram too, is like, I feel like the pendulum is always swinging, right? So if it's like, if we over here, we're all dealing with self-hatred, we've got to swing the whole thing back to self-love, and I find that for most people, like for myself included, most of the time I walk around right in the middle and I'm pretty neutral. Meaning I take care of myself because I respect myself because it makes me feel good. I do the things I do like, you know, do my best to eat a nourishing diet, to get some movement, to go outside and be in my garden and, and all these things because it makes me feel amazing. But that being said, I'm not walking around every day just being like you're the fucking shit you're like look at <laughs> you're how so sexy today look how great you look you look amazing because i think that that also puts an inordinate amount of emphasis on the body and if we're talking about this from a, a body perspective of yeah. self-love um certainly we can extend that to the entire person but i feel like when we're in that space of self-love too um that for a lot of people from self-hatred is it you might as well be asking them to swim across the pacific ocean it's just so it's huge. so incredibly foreign as well it's so huge and your subconscious is like yeah right okay so you know for a lot of people they self-sabotage because they're like i'm never going to get to the place where i love myself like that's such a like you said a foreign concept so i feel like for a lot of people we sort of exist there are high highs and low lows, and that's that's certainly the extent of of human experience. 
But a lot of people, myself included, kind of the day to day are in the middle. It's very neutral. I sent this out to the email list today when I got questions for you. A ton of people were like, I want to ask her 20 questions. <laughs> I'm only going to have time for like five of them. But, but one thing that I loved is that you said over time, I came to appreciate my body for yeah. what it could do instead of what size my thighs were. Yeah. I love that because it's like shifting the polarity of instead of focusing on the body, mm -hmm. it's like, oh, what can my body do? And how can I make that doing more powerful? Like that's a big reframe. It is a big reframe. And, and yet uh, there have been people who are like, but what if you couldn't, you know, what if you couldn't squat tomorrow? You woke up, you couldn't squat for the rest of your life. You couldn't weight lift for the rest of your life that. So I see it along a continuum, you know, being putting all of our worth in what we look like is certainly a very, very difficult place to be in shifting it to what we are capable of doing despite our, like, doesn't matter what our size is, is like the next step for a lot of people. And, and that's what, you know, CrossFit helped me with. Um, just so many things of like, I don't need to be a specific size to feel strong and capable and powerful. Yeah. Yet, I, I feel like there's still a, an acceptance, a movement in this direction of um, I, I am good and worthy, full stop. No, it doesn't matter what I can do. It doesn't hinge on what I can do. It doesn't hinge on how I look. And so, yeah, like, it's a process. And I feel like as you get older, I'm 39, so we're very pretty much the same age. Yeah. Um, that things start to sort of shift in that direction too, where it's like, am I, you know, do I respect myself? Uh, do I have those those moments of, you know, appreciation and kindness and to myself and compassion? And um, I still get stoked about the things like I can do like a, you know, I can, I just deadlifted that or whatever. And I, mm -hmm. or I just, you know, went on a backpacking trip. And I think those are amazing moments for people. But I think that there is still a layer below that of or beneath that of like, am I okay? And I see this a lot when people get injured in their sport. So they're like, okay, I do this sport or I have this physical activity that I do. It takes the emphasis off of what my body looks like. And for the first time in my life, I've been able to let that go. It's so freeing. And then they're like, I got hurt and I can't do that thing. And it's driving me crazy because now what do I do with mm -hmm. myself? And what's my identity now? Yeah. It, it, yeah. So it comes down to, to that in a lot of ways. And so, yes, uh, I feel like that's been a very important stepping stone for me. And I do frequently ask myself that, like, if this got taken away from me tomorrow, would I be okay with it? And, and the fact of the matter is, I just love physically moving my body. I love that expression. I love that physical culture. Yeah. Um, I have for the last, you know, year and a half or so taken time away from competing, which is a huge, you know, step for me just to give myself some space. But it, in that space, it's been like, can I do these things just for the, the enjoyment of it, for the, for the love of it? And I have competed in sports since I was little. So this has been an interesting, you know, like people are, when is the next competition? And I'm like, I don't know. Yeah, I'm just not doing anything right now. Don't you feel like it's because you're focused on creating something new, and that's kind of taking all your chi? Oh, so at, there's almost oh, like sure. no room for you to compete. For sure, if I and and that was sort of a a, a conscious decision, which is like if I'm um, pushing forward and we've got this book in the works and like all these other things, there's only so much of my energy that can go. <laughs> there's around. only so much Stephanie to go around. There's only so much uh, energy that I have. Yeah, and um, so yeah, so I just sort of like. You know, I, I, I'd love to put this out there for people is just to start thinking about, you know, have I considered this idea of like, I'm very happy with what my body can do. Therefore, I'm not worried about what it looks like. Is that my stopping point? Or is there something beyond that? Is there something yeah. deeper than that? What's underlying? Um, have I accepted myself as is now, no matter what? Um I love your analogy of the pendulum swing. Mm -hmm. And I think we could apply that to multiple movements. Oh, uh, sure. One of them I want to talk to you about later in the podcast is me too. Because I know that's a very charged issue, right? And it's, it's one that deserves attention as well. But I think about this pendulum and it's like if people are just focused on the self-love and self-care, well, there can almost be like almost a, a passivity or a pacifying mm -hmm. of progress, right? If they're just focused on self-love. Mm -hmm. And then on the other side, if they're just like, oh my God, uh, I only care about like how I look and exactly what my body feels like and how I look in a swimsuit. There's got to be this middle. Well, it, it, it's this idea of fluidity. Mm -hmm. And are we, are we able to 
move in and out of things as are necessary for us. And, and I, you know, the older I get, the more I'm in this world of health and wellness, the more I'm like, we have so many, um, complementary, uh, you could call them diametrically opposed. You could, whatever you want to call them, but we have so many of these things. that's like, um, and I love this idea of like me to we, you know, are there times where you need to buckle down and like get your house in order, get your shit together, yeah, take care of yourself so you can then go out and do good things in the world and serve people and, and start living into your idea of like your highest self. Yes. But too much inward. And I talk about this with my clients, like too much inward focus can be really stifling for people. It can serve to reinforce where, where we are not at. It, and this is one of the reasons why positive affirmations don't work for a lot of people. Again, it's like that part of your subconscious brain that's like, mm, okay, like, come on. We're not, sure. we're not there. Uh, they work for some people, not for others. But I think the point is that, you know, if we're too much focused on we and we don't ever consider ourselves, then we start to lose ourselves. We start to perhaps not take care of ourselves. We're only caring for others before we put energy back into our own system. Like, so what's the right answer? I don't know. I think the answer is to be able to be fluid and flexible and surrender when necessary and take a stand when necessary. And so I, when I talk to people about strength, I'm like, look, strength isn't always just the raw, raw charge forward. I'm going to like ah, Hulk out and go squat all the things. Sometimes strength is realizing that you need to give yourself a rest day. Yeah. That you've um, been focusing too much on yourself and that if you start reaching out into your community, connect with people, you may find a purpose to sort of drive you forward. Can we be flexible enough and fluid enough to do that? And recognize that we're going to have to move between these phases at different por- par- different points in our life. And that maybe it's not just two opposite sides of the coin. There is a continuum and in, in how we navigate that and we flow. But the more rigid we are, you know, the more, you know, young we are and all of these things like, ah, yep. just going crazy. Like strength means a lot of things. Strength is also quiet. Strength is surrender. Strength is letting go of things. Strength is retreating into yourself strength is taking time off like it it means so many different things it's so multifaceted Um, the more we can do that I think the better able we are to navigate the pendulum swings and perhaps we need to we do need to swing to one side but I you know just like anything in motion we're probably going to then move in yeah. some direction, and are we okay with that? Let's talk about strength then, because strength is a huge part of your life. You're a coach still in strength, right? Certified mm-hmm. uh, CSCS? Uh, I'm a USA weightlifting level one coach. Okay. I yeah. feel like that's just as badass. <laughs> Same thing? Uh, I don't know exactly what the requirements <laughs> of a CSCS are, but I've been coaching at Fortius here in San Diego for three years in the Olympic weightlifting program. So for someone, I'd love to talk to that person right now who's like really wanting to get stronger Mm. but they are just kind of unsure a Mm -hmm. little bit of trepidation and actually a great question from instagram from amber she said what is the biggest limiting belief you see in women about their ability to lift heavy or to transform their Mm. physique such a good question the biggest limiting belief that i run across with my female athletes is that i will get hurt i will get hurt and it's crazy to me because I hear, I never hear this when people are talking to guys. If a guy comes along and he's like, hey, I just joined this new gym. Like, I I really want to check out weightlifting or powerlifting or I want to go to CrossFit. Never have I heard somebody say or read somebody say to this, this gentleman, be careful, you might get hurt. Ever. Yet, the number of times I've seen that somebody in this woman's life will say this to her. It makes me so fucking mad. It makes me so angry when I hear that because I'm like, you have now planted a seed that Mm -hmm. was probably there all along and now you've put some water on that seed that she should be careful. She could get hurt. This could be dangerous. Yeah, I could like walk across the street right now and twist my ankle. I could, uh, like being physically active does not, automatically cause injury. (laughs) 
you know, we need to take ego out of it. Yes. Ego is the most dangerous thing in the gym. Uh huh. Period. Working outside of your limits, knowing that you're outside of your limits, like really outside of your limits and continuing to push it because you want to keep up with everybody else or because this is, that's dangerous. Doing stupid things, that's dangerous. Uh, I broke my I broke my finger on a barbell in the gym a few years ago. You know how I was doing? I I was rolling the bar to put it away and I broke my finger. Wow. Like it's just such freak things that happen. Most of the injuries I've seen in the gym have been complete freak just freak things. So why did that trigger you so much then? What was that? Why were you so upset about that? I get Cuz my mom has been like, "Be careful, Josh. Be careful when you drive today." She says <laughs> it every day, you know. <laughs> yeah, but it be, but because we have this narrative that women are inherently weaker, that they don't know how to handle themselves. And that, yes, uh, I think there are more guys out there who, when they were in high school, were like their older brother was, you know, benching in the garage and they would go mess around in the garage or their sports team was weightlifting or their dad. I've talked to a lot of people who are like, my dad used to be into weights and like yeah. I would learn from him. And that I think that's less common for females. Um, and, and so I understand where it comes from, but I'm like, can you just check yourself before you limit that woman before she's already scared she's already overwhelmed um she's already unsure of herself and so for the women that come into the gym uh it's very this is you know generalization but what i tend to see more often than not is you know i'm there and working with them i think that's huge to have a female coach um i'm very used to being kind of the lone female i go to BJJ, I'm like usually the only chick there. All the almost all the coaches are I remember guys. You took me there almost a year ago, and <laughs> yeah. I was just like so intimidated. I'm like, she's the only one. Yeah, I mean, we have uh, we have some some females that go. We have a, a great female black belt um, professor and stuff, and it's a great environment to learn in. But I'm very comfortable with being in male dominated fitness environments, CrossFit. I mean, you name it. I think though, for a woman to have another woman there is very powerful, and I also see that women and I remember my own journey at the beginning was very much like I can't do that and yes like as a coach I don't want to force somebody to do to do something that they're completely uncomfortable with so that's my job as a coach is to walk that line consider the athlete's goals what do they want to achieve yet to be can I put myself in her position and go she's very unsure I look at her movement patterns. Her movement patterns are fine. We're at a safe weight. She's not going to get hurt. But can we move the needle a little bit more? Can yeah. we can we push that a little bit more? And so I think for for women finding a a coach or a gym where you feel comfortable, there's somebody there who listens to you and what you actually want to accomplish. I can't tell you the number of women. I have a community on Facebook with over five thousand people. The vast majority of them are women. The number of women who have come to c- come to this group and said, like, my trainer is pushing me to, like, they want me to do this. This is not what I want to do in the first place. They're not listening to me. That's a huge problem. So, like, we could just talk about that. But I think, you know, it's finding a way to help women be comfortable, progress, but understanding that a lot of the limitations that, that women have on themselves is because of this narrative, right? This narrative that girls can't be strong, women can't be strong. Uh, I don't know about you, but I look, I watch the Olympics. Um, I watch somebody like Morgan King, Jenny Arthur. These are all female um, Olympians from the United States in the sport of weightlifting. You know, if you if you look at their Wilkes calculation, which is basically their the amount they're lifting per their body weight, they're. I mean, women can be very strong. Mm-hmm. Steffi Cohen powerlifting i've seen her on instagram i wow. mean come on yeah. she's 120 pounds ish yes right deadlifting five five something she's she's amazing right so we have these things of like and then it's like oh well she must be on so then we get the backlash of people oh she must be on steroids she couldn't possibly be that strong oh she's just a she's just lucky you know mm-hmm. um and i think that that narrative of the fact that women can be strong um is very it's just very unusual and and uh, it's just not normal. And so I get where it comes from, but I have to say, like, if you're somebody who uh, a female in your life is thinking about going to the gym or getting involved in a fitness program, like, I'm going to go to Orange Theory, I'm going to go whatever it is, I'm going to go to CrossFit, I'm going to learn power lift. 
support her in a constructive way. Yeah. Um, and I think that's the biggest hesitation that I see a lot of women. They're like, I'm going to, I'm automatically going to get hurt just by stepping in a gym. And I'm like, okay, um, working on your strength in a way that's within your capacity in a controlled environment is probably a lot safer than other things you're going to do. And actually the sport of weightlifting itself proper, the injury rate is much lower than um, some of the like field sports, basketball, soccer. I mean, we see like, you know, twist and sprain injuries and a lot of those other sports, knee injuries. Oh my God. Well, with weights, I mean, you have to be present when you're running or when you're doing soccer or whatever, it can be like a little lackadaisical, right? There's lots of people around when you're at the barbell. Yeah. It's just you and your body and your breath and the barbell. Yeah. And you're going to progress like in your own way. And that's, you know, I think learning on YouTube, it has its limits and like learning on from videos has, has its limits. And so I really encourage people if they want to get involved with this, they want to be in the best environment to ask their friends in their area, where do you go? Do you like mm. it? Check it out. See what you feel like. How does it feel in your, like, do you get a good gut feeling? Do you get a good vibe from the place? And I know a lot of people like to shop on price and I get that. But if you go to a gym that you don't really like the vibe there, you're not going to really want to go. So, um, yeah. I and just, also, depending on what personality type you are, if you spend a bunch of money for a gym, it's going to give you that outer framework, that external framework for accountability and motivation yeah. to go. Yeah. It's like you're investing in the strength of you. I, I got to ask this question, too, because like you've talked about this, like the, the weight room is like a very male dominated place mm-hmm. for the most part, right? A lot of masculine energy in yeah. there. How do you operate? You said like you have no problem being in those environments. Mm -hmm. How do you operate in that environment and also still have a strong grounded pull to your feminine side? Like how do you balance the both in the weight room and out of the weight room? I think a lot of women might get scared like, oh, I'm going to get too masculine if I go in there. Mm -hmm. Well, this comes down to honoring who you are as a person. I am not a very girly female. I just never have been. I feel like I'm feminine in a lot of ways. I for me like I don't do my nails it's just not something like I don't wear I don't usually don't wear makeup and I don't fault anybody who does like if that's who you are and you feel fantastic when you do it and you do it for you then rock rock it (laughs) rock it be who you are I've seen some photos of you online with makeup yeah and I I I do it for usually promotional stuff okay okay um but it's not my everyday and so for me I just you know I just go and I show up and I do my thing and I'm I am who I am. On the other hand, we have some some lifters in our gym. Nicole comes to mind. Nicole loves pink. Pink is her favorite color. And she's got a pink belt and pink knee sleeves and pink shoes. And she wears pink shirts. And she just loves. That's just her. Yeah. So she's who she is. And she can still be who she is within that space. Some people come in and they put headphones on. And, and they just want to go into themselves and be quiet. And other people want to connect with other folks in the gym and be boisterous and loud and um, celebrate the environment and get the energy from other people. And so I, I really think for me um, th- that when I honor who I am, that that just means that I am able to stay connected to both sides of me and both sides of who I am. And I've yeah. been told by a lot of people, like you're very, in, you're very intimidating. And um, I mean, you're pretty intense. <laughs> I don't know. Like it, it's interesting. Uh, so recently I sat, I sat down with a friend of mine online um, who is a, uh, her name's Eliza. Eliza's a, a, a bruja. She's just loves to read people's cards and stuff like that. And um, I want to go see her. She's amazing. Uh, she, she does stuff online, but she was like, you're it, so I've always felt this very conflicted um, sort of energy in parts of my personality where I'm very uh, I like, you know, feeling strong and I like to um, I feel very practical and very black and white on a lot of things. And there's a huge part of me that's very like, oh, dreamy and, you know, intuitive and come to find out uh, I'm very uh I was, I am a Pisces, but everything else about me is Capricorn, which is very grounded and earthy yeah, and practical. Yeah. Um, so that was really interesting when she, uh, she read all that for me. I was like, oh, I, this makes so much sense. I'm so glad to know this. But the point being that I am very, I wear my emotions on my sleeve. hundred percent. I remember the first time we interviewed we were finished and you were like, hey, that was cool. And I was like, yeah, that was so great. Thank you so much. And you're like, yeah, I'm glad you weren't a douchebag. <laughs> and I was like, wow, she really speaks her mind. Um, yeah, I, maybe it's because I'm the oldest of four kids. 
you know, I, I just, I don't know, but I, um, it's very hard for me to, to hide my emotions. I am, I feel like a walking contradiction sometimes because I feel like, yes, I am very strong. I have a strong physical outer shell, but I am also extremely soft and squishy. What is your way to drop into that? Because like everyone sees you as strength. I mean, harder to kill is a pretty strong name, Mm -hmm. but how do you drop into that part where you are soft and squishy? Like, what does that look like for women? I, uh, when I coach people in my community, especially, and, and I don't always get to coach them in, in person, which is, you know, one of the things I kind of regret about working online the most is I don't get a lot of personal in time, in person time. But, um, I, I try to care for people as I would want to be cared for. And it's constantly walking this line between, uh, knowing and having an intuition and having a knowing about who needs what, when, and showing up for those people. So I'm not a mother. Um, I don't have children of my own. But I feel um, that this is a very feminine part of, of my energy is to be a nurturer of people in, in my own way. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, for I have a lot of friends who are very much into different aspects of spirituality and they just, they rock it. You know, they're like, they they read people's cards. They are very big into crystals. They love that stuff. They see huge benefits for the people they work with. I am very drawn to plants. And I think this is sort of the direction I'm going in is to learn more about herbalism and stuff like that. But for me, I, even though I am not a mother in a biological sense, I feel like part of my role is as this female nurturing figure for a lot of the people in my community. That was hard to do when you're putting up just a Facebook post. But when I'm coaching my folks, like I really try to hold, try to hold space for them. Yeah. And to me, that's how I, I honor that part of who I am. That's how I show up with that piece of me. I'm very empathic. Um, I'm an HSP, so highly sensitive person. Mm-hmm. I pick up on You're I'm, sitting across from another HSP. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so we're all going to, we're going to go home later Two and go, go lie down in a quiet dark room. Um, <laughs> I'm going to go for a walk after this. Yeah. You know, so for me, I, I, I do spend a lot of time being quiet. I do spend a lot of time. Uh, you notice we don't have a couch. I spend a lot of time on the ground. I like to be outside barefoot. I love my plants. We're sitting within 18 inches of plants. <laughs> yeah. It's a my, beautiful garden right here. My garden. Um, I had, I, I was a beekeeper for three years. So nature is how I feel uh, connected in my own way. I mean, we're here in kind of the urban jungle of San Diego. Yep. And uh, I've, I've cultivated these little areas for me that regenerate my energy. Mm. So um, being close to the ground helps for me. Being um, quiet and, you know, Z works from home here. And you were like, you guys both work from home. You know, um, that could be challenging. It can be challenging. Um, we're very, we're both very good about sort of dropping into work mode, and and then we are in home mode and stuff like that. But I'm able to go and lie down and close the door and sit in a dark room if I want. This and that's is a very skill important. set, though. I mean, this rest component in a world that's like incessantly trying to break our attention into a pile and then earn money from how many clicks we push on our phone. It's hard Ugh, to rest. Like, yeah. how, do, how do you give yourself permission to rest? How do you give your community permission so they can rest? Mm. Some people need permission from somebody else. And it was interesting. I think it's Brene Brown was talking about permission. I may have, I may be getting this wrong. It may be somebody else. I mean, she's definitely talked about permission. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it, it, the way that I remember it being talked about is, and it was summed up so perfectly is like people need permission when they do not have, they do not have pow- their, their sense of inner power is eroded, is not there for whatever reason and whatever aspect of their life. And um, so sometimes, you know, hearing permission from another person, you think it's like, oh, like, that's a sign of weakness. I think it's a sign of strength to say, I need help. Can like, can I do this? And somebody's like, you have like, yeah, take the day off. Don't go to the gym. Spend time with your family. However you need that permission for yourself. Um, I think that that's a sign of strength to be able to ask for that. But yep. at the same token, um, for me, you know, being away from this thing and I'm holding up my phone, being away from that thing um, is something I'm, I'm trying to do more and more. I have in the last, it's interesting in the last to like to last week uh, I, I legit forgot my phone twice 
How good did that feel? And I was going out of the house for a while, you know, I was like, and I usually like to film stuff at the gym and like get content to post up and, and, and that stuff. And I was like, well, <laughs> guess I'm not filming anything today. And um, I didn't have the sense of like freak out, but I was kind of like, actually, this is kind of nice. And so what's that all about? You know, conveniently forgot it. But, you know, for me, I try to do things during the day that replenish my energy and I think so many times we feel under pressure in our work environments. I mean, I don't have an excuse here. I create my own work environment. Uh, so I can either be the world's best or worst boss, depending on how you look at it. But so many people in their day to day feel like they just cannot slow down. They cannot take a step away. And I, you know, it maybe you can't leave for an hour on your lunch break and go sit in a park, but there are things that you can do to just switch the channel you know, if you have a very mentally taxing job yeah, and you're, you know, you're sitting there standing at your desk, whatever it is, and you've got to be thinking, thinking, thinking and creating and doing all these things, even if it's sort of more, um, you know, just routine tasks is like find a way to switch it up, like do something physical. And I'm not saying you have to go to, to an hour fitness class. Yeah, you might be wearing a tie. Maybe you can just get in like squats and pushups. Take your own ass, but just walk around the building or get outside and just take some fresh air. Um, that stuff can be really renewing for people in very you know, like small doses. Mm. And so I think there's this big misconception that what we're going to do for our health has to come in these big blocks of time. And, oh, I don't have, you know, 20 minutes to meditate. And it's like, can I just go outside, sit on my steps, close my eyes, do some, you know, <laughs> take some deep breaths, soak in the, some of the sunshine and come back inside and, and do some work. And so a yeah. lot of times my midday break now is I go out and I just putter in the garden. Now, not everybody can do that at their work. That's, that's totally fine. But I, I like challenge people to create some kind of experience that works for them. It could be, you're going to take a book and go, um, go sit outside in your, I don't know, maybe you have like a, a nearby park maybe you have just an employee break area outside i would say there's always a place where people could go if they yeah, look for it yeah and just getting out of that that normal environment and i feel like now there's so much pressure people feel either there is pressure from their you know upper management or whoever it is like to be on task all the time all the time and i'm like is that are we really actually being productive and getting things done cuz i know for me if i don't take breaks enough I'm like, wow, I've been scrolling, <laughs> scrolling, <laughs> you know, the internet for 25 minutes. Yeah, your nervous system I wants need a break. break. I your need nervous a break. system wants a break. So it's like, I, I can't allow you to do this work anymore. I have to pull you over yeah. this way. So how have you seen the contrast then? Because your husband's not from this country. Right. Was it different when you went over there? Did you see the culture differently? I, You know, the UK in a lot of ways, I feel like is similar to the United States in a lot of ways. I don't want to offend anybody from either country, <laughs> how they feel about that. But uh, for, you know, I've, I've spent a little bit of time in Southeast Asia. I've spent some time in New Zealand, um, some time in, in the UK. And I would say the UK in, in my experience is probably the most similar to the, to the U S and, you know, people are working their jobs and, um, you know, have a million things to do and feel like they're under a lot of pressure. So yeah. um, I don't feel like things are actually all that different from when I was there. It was a, it was a similar experience for me, and and the thing is, and the biggest like take home lesson about permission is, no one's gonna give you the permission on a daily basis. Like yeah. you, like you just sort of have to say what is the priority for me right now, and like what's gonna put a little bit of energy back into my tank. And I know that's hard for people when you feel like you have a lot of obligations, but I would also sort of challenge you to to think about how many times am I saying yes to things that aren't things I really want to do because I feel guilty or I feel obligated and how can I free up some time and energy with just being a bit more discerning. So one of the things I tell people is like, if someone asks you to do something, I don't know, volunteer for something or you know, get involved in a social thing is just say, I would like to get back to you in 24 hours with my answer. I'll let you know tomorrow. Don't ask them, can I? You tell them, I will get back to you tomorrow. That's it. That's all it takes. And that, so for some people, gives them the space to just like woosah, breathe out, go like. <sighs> do I really want that? I don't actually really want to do this. Yeah. And the more I feel like we say yes to things that we don't want to do, we take that small 
amount of energy that we potentially did have. And it's just, we either end up resenting the thing, we resent the person, we don't really want to be there, we're not fully present. Um, and d- doing something out of a sense of guilt is like, I don't know, I just, I just sort of question whether or not that's a great place to operate. It's like sometimes the platitudes that are the most spoken are the most true for a reason. Mm-hmm. The, the degree between the truth from what we know, what we feel is right within ourselves versus what we actually allow ourselves to do, mm-hmm. that space is the degree of our suffering. It's the degree mm-hmm. of disease. It's the it's mm-hmm. the degree of everything that really feels pressurized and tension in our lives. And I, I want to go more tactic with you because we've done a lot of like neck up today. <laughs> so I want I want to go like neck down, like learn a little bit more about Steph's heart a little bit. Yeah. Um, fast questions like Liz Lemon is your hero. Like why do you love Liz Lemon so much? Because she is just she just owns it. She's not she's imperfect and she's a hot mess half the time and she doesn't really hide it. She's just who she is. And uh, she is very clear about, you know, not having all, all it all figured out. And I think that that's a huge, that amount of vulnerability and just like, shit. <laughs> that's the hardest We're thing. all kind of a mess, you know? Yeah. Um, I think she, in a lot of, in a lot of ways, I, I admire that about her. What's been one of your biggest food failures? In other words, have you, have you ever had something explode and get over the, the roof oh, and the ground? And uh, we're, we're actually sitting in her place, and I can see her kitchen right now. It's a very like modest kitchen. Yeah. It, it's not a photo shoot kitchen. But no. yet, have you ever had something explode and just get totally crazy in the kitchen? <laughs> I've definitely had a lot of. Uh, I've burned a lot of. I burned a lot of things. Okay. Sometimes we have a seventy-year-old oven. Uh, so I say I, I, I've burned more things than not. And, and I am one of those people who really doesn't use a timer. I always know something's done when I can smell it. Going back to it wow. being an HSP, okay. you know, being able to like smell that that's done. And Z always uh, jokes about that with me. But, um, I, you know, I haven't had anything really explode. I would say I had I was making kombucha a year or two ago and the jar uh, you know, in the second fermentation, you can put in fruit or whatever you want and, and try to capture some carbonation. So you put a lid on it, unlike the first fermentation where it's sort of uh, open and you just, I just put like a rag on top of it, but it accumulates pressure. And uh, I lifted up this jar because I was like, hey, this looks done. And the 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 ass end of the jar just fell off because oh. it was cracked and it was just like a flood a flood of kombucha. So I would say more often than not, it's not an explosion. It's like I have knocked something over. I'm such a messy person. Okay. Yeah. All right. Sometimes the ass falls out of some things. It does. That's just how it goes. Um, if you could see Tony Federico where, he's a mutual friend of yeah. ours. He actually was kind of like the genesis to you forming your podcast. Mm-hmm. A lot of people don't know that. He really helped you out with that. Yeah. If you could see him wear anything and then post it on social, what would you ask him to wear that would make you laugh? What could, what could you see Tony wearing that would make you crack up? A SpongeBob SquarePants costume. <laughs> yes, I think definitely. <laughs> yeah. Or maybe like an apron. I think he could pull it off. I mean, Tony is such a good natured guy. Yeah. And uh, I think I think I would like to see that uh, for Halloween. Tony has SpongeBob SquarePants. I'm going to ask this because you already posted this morning that you didn't know the answer, but I'm going to ask you anyways. Uh, Melanie <laughs> from Instagram said, how do I make paleo raviolis? And you were like, listen, I don't exactly know. You buy Capello, you buy Capello's pasta which is uh, they have a really nice grain-free, gluten-free pasta dough. I don't think they have ravioli, but they have like fettuccine. So you go and you buy it from them because they're pros at what they do. So you did know. I, I Here's the thing. So I used to work in a bakery. I I used to bake all the time. And now I could give a rat's ass about baking because it's just, for me, it takes too much time. I'm all people ask me all the time, what do you what do you eat? And I tell them the recipes that are on the website. <laughs> uh, you know, if I'm gonna make a recipe, most of the time it's like meat and some vegetables on a plate, and that's about it. It's very simple. Um, and for me, baking right now is just takes too much precision and mm-hmm. accuracy. And I just I like to cook by intuition. I just like, you know, I just put things this is why recipe creation for me is sometimes a difficult thing because I'm like, I got to measure things. This isn't how I cook. But um, baking takes a lot of precision, a lot of very, uh, you got to measure things, you got to be very careful, because it's very much like alchemy. 
cooking, not so much. Yes. So I don't do a lot of baking anymore, which is sort of like pasta dough, I feel like falls under that realm. But I would say uh, Zen Belly, Simone, she may have some uh, some good ravioli stuff. She's with. got good stuff. I've she seen is her. A, you know, she's a caterer and she's got mm-hmm. some good stuff. Um, or Jenny, the urban poser, um, she, she's she got some stuff too. So I would look into both of those ladies and see what they have. My or bro- go buy your Capellos. <laughs> <laughs> Capellos is good too. Yeah. And I've seen them in most grocery stores. Yeah. Uh, my brother James actually asked this question. Oh, hey James. Uh, what's up James? I need help selecting the right foods. I feel like it really boils down to shopping right. Steph, can you weigh in on what foods to choose at the grocery store or which foods to avoid? Yeah. The million dollar question, James. Thanks for, thanks for throwing me a softball. Um, the, <laughs> you know, I think people get really caught up in like, you know, diet rules and what's, what's the right, he used the word right and he, what's the right mm-hmm. thing. I would just encourage people to do the best they can. And for some people that's going to be like, today I will eat a vegetable. I'm going to eat something green. Great. How do I cook it? I don't know. Whatever way you like, you can eat it raw. Like, I mean, I would say if somebody's looking for a guideline, it would be, you know, trying to avoid processed foods as much as possible. Um, you know, the the majority of what you eat is colorful, right? So trying new fruits and vegetables, having some protein on your plate, whether that's from a plant-based source or an animal source, you know, do what's within your budget. A lot of people inevitably will end up selecting better quality things as they learn more about sustainability and like animal welfare and what's good for the environment. And I mean, this can get so overwhelming, but it's just like, just start where you are. If you're eating processed food and frozen lean cuisine for every meal, like for you, a, a good first start would be, let's eat some, some vegetables. We'll cut down on the sodium. We'll maybe make a chicken breast and, um, you know, put some avocado on the plate. Keep yeah. it simple. You know, shopping the perimeter of the store, it sounds like really cheesy, but it can, can be a great easy step for people. It's like, okay, I'm going to just eat fruits and vegetables. I'm going to include more of those on my plate. Maybe I still keep, um, rice around i keep potatoes like that don't get too worried about that stuff in in the short term what's your view on protein powders it depends you know i feel like so many of my answers when i talk to people about food are like well a general guideline um so first of all a lot of people just do they're, they're doing so much physical activity that for them to get their protein requirement it's real, and I find this for women especially. You know, Protein is the most satiating mac- macronutrient. So, if you're like, well, I'm going to try to get you know one gram of protein per pound of body weight, and I'm currently at half of that, that's going to be a huge gap. And so, for a lot of people, a protein shake after they do their workout can help to close that gap. Yeah. Um, you know, for weight loss clients, I try to recommend that they stick to to eating their food instead of drinking their calories. It's very easy to accidentally end up with like an 800 calorie shake almond butter you're like man i put some almond butter and i (laughs) used coconut milk you can do like 500 calories in almond butter in one scoop yeah it's a lot you know it can and so i try to recommend that for for clients who really want fat loss they're trying to normalize their uh, insulin response and stuff like that and just try to to get back on track that they stick to chewing their food most of the time to produce that satiety signal because that's very very important um, even for people that are using uh, a protein shake and and they've got no issues is like include something on the top of it that you have to chew coconut flakes cacao nibs sliced almonds i mean something where you're you physically have to chew to kick on that satiety signal because yeah. i don't know about you i can on the way home from jujitsu i'll usually drink a uh, whey protein mixed with water sometimes a little bit of coconut water so i've got some protein and, and carbs there and yeah. and uh you know i can drink that and and be like i feel like i just drank water i'm super hungry still yes so um I, you know i think for most people it's like visualize a plate on half that plate we want veggies Half. Yeah, half, yeah. right? So half yep. the plate, veggies, um, maybe fruit a couple, once or twice a day. I mean, in the summertime, I'm like, give me all the berries. Just give me the berries and no one gets hurt. The rest of the year, I'm kind of like, you know, apples in December. Like, eh, I'm not really all that interested in that. But mm-hmm. um, And so then I take the, the other half of the plate. Um, I usually try to, to have people visualize like two-thirds of what's left would be a protein source and about one-third of that that 
what piece that's left would be some kind of fat. So, so you get all your starches from the veggies. Yeah, um, yeah, and I mean, it depends on the person. For some people, white rice works really well. It's gluten free. It tends to be very non-allergenic. However, for some people, it makes their blood sugar just completely go crazy. Did you do the carb test that Rob talked about in his new book? I didn't do the carb test. Um, I kind of know just based on feel Mm because I've been eating this way for so long um, how certain things make me react. Like I don't digest um, legumes all that well. So I tend to just stay away. It's not really a blood sugar thing. It's more a digestion digestion and FODMAP thing for me. So I tend to not do a lot of beans um, or legumes, but you know sometimes it depends. If I have just come back in the morning and I just rolled for a half an hour and I was at JITS uh, in the morning, I'll put some potatoes on my plate. I'll have some. Um, occasionally, we'll do rice uh, after if we lift. We'll like come back. Even sometimes go to Chipotle and and get a, a bowl with rice and that sort of thing. And and you know for fo- folks that are looking for some kind of body composition change, if they can try to stick a big dose of their carbs after their workout, that can be very helpful to still maintain and not feel like uh, maintain their energy levels and maintain their thyroid health and not uh, completely get drained, but but still make progress toward their goals. I feel like um, sticking your carbs after your workout just because you're more insulin sensitive can be like a really good rule of thumb for people so they don't have to worry about it. But um, yeah, for folks that aren't really super active in the morning, I just really like a a protein, veggies, and healthy fat kind of breakfast to um, help stabilize blood sugar. I used to be hypoglycemic, reactive hypoglycemic, so I would like eat sugar all day long. (laughs) Uh, My breakfast used to be when when I was living in Arizona. This is after I got divorced from my first husband, and I was like living alone and like in a new state, and just my life was completely upside down. And so I would go to the Circle K next door to my apartment. That's always a bad first sentence, isn't it? <laughs> so I uh, went to the Circle K. <laughs> yeah, and I would get like the biggest coffee that they had and, you know, put like a million uh, in international creamer, in you know, international foods creamers in it. And um, my breakfast would be a, a Metrex Big 100 um, chocolate chip cookie protein bar. That's what I ate for breakfast. And then I would, you know, eat sugar all day long. And then I would come home and drink like a, a bottle of wine. And that's like how I ate for a really long time Mm. or for almost like a year um, during that like post-divorce phase. So I, when I talk to people about nutrition, I'm like, trust me, there's, there's no judgment. And I come at this from a place of compassion because I get what it's like to just be like, my life is in such a turmoil. I can't even think about feeding myself right now, like in being healthy, like I just have to survive. Mm. But, um, you know, I would say just sticking to as many sort of like, can you recognize that as a food, trying to cut down on processed food, trying to reduce sugar. I mean, some people get really carried away with like, I have to eat zero sugar in my diet and it's making me stressed because then I need to- Don't you feel like that's a way to hide though? And I found this with like 30 day challenges. Mm. Um, It's like, can I be perfect on the challenge? And by me focusing on the 30 day challenge, I'm actually going to ignore the emotions that are driving the bad health. Some of it for sure, for sure. And it's an artificial environment- because when you do a lot of challenges and programs, you end up sort of becoming a hermit for that amount of time, right? You can't go out with your friends. You don't go out. You stay home. <laughs> you cook a lot. Real, you know, it's like you can kind of isolate yourself. And I feel like while you can learn some very important skills, and I certainly don't fault those programs. For a lot of people, they work. Um, they they help people to realize things that they had just had no conception of before they get them interested in cooking again lots of positives is to is to realize that that may not represent your real life and like what happens when your kid like wakes up in the middle of the night puking and you just like yeah can't real life happens yeah, real life happens and you're like oh no now I've got a I can't meal prep today what am I gonna do or like I have to I'm traveling and I there are no options for me here that fit within my paradigm what am I gonna do or I get invited to an event and I don't know exactly what the food is like. And I mean, obviously, like real legit allergies aside, like I think sometimes we get so used to being in that space of like the rules are this. And as long as I can be in my little bubble, it's going to be great. And then I go outside of that and I'm like, I don't know how to navigate the world. For a lot of people, that's a bit challenging. Mm. So, you know, just baby steps. And I always say this to people. Okay, so your brother, like what what are you interested in changing, trying what sounds good to you? What feels right? And, you know, so many people, again, are looking for that. Just like, give me give me direction. If somebody wants direction, that's great. But if I can get 
a client to have buy-in and have autonomy in that process, it's going to be a much different scenario than if I came to you and I was like, all right, Josh, you can't eat all your favorite foods that you've been eating for I the mean, last anytime, year. If a sentence starts you know, with that, it's going to cause tension in most yeah, people, right? Yeah, it, it does. If it's you a, take it away in the beginning. For sure. And I mean, obviously there's guidelines, um, but when I work with clients, I, I try to focus on adding things you know, we, you know, there, to me, it's, it's usually not a, like you can never have, it's like, well, given these things, we may want to limit, start cutting down. Um, but I oftentimes try to start with, we're going to like add some of these things, make a swap. Um, you know, so for a lot of people, it is just like, can we eat another vegetable today? Mm. It sounds so basic or yep. like, can, can we try making a pot of bone broth on the weekend and see what that, and it's like, we can't change everything all at one time. And then we have these habits that are, and behaviors that are dominoes for things in our lives that if we just focus on a couple of things and do those really well, the, the journey will begin to unfold. The path will begin to lay itself. But when we get started on these journeys, we're like, I've got to change every single thing. And for a lot of people, they're either cohabitating with roommates, they live with a family, uh, you know, they, they, they're not just in that bubble. And so how do you navigate that space? Um, changing everything can just make life super stressful. Mm -hmm. And, um, if you're not change is, in, is inherently uncomfortable for a lot of people, but I still think there should be an, an, an aspect of like, I'm in, I'm invested in this process. I'm open. I'm curious. I want to experiment with this or check this out. And, um, if you're not in that space, I don't know if you're ready, you know, to have at least a little bit of curiosity and openness. Like it's okay to have it not be the, the right time on the flip side. If you've been saying that for like the last eight years and you just are having resistance, like find someone who can work with you, find yeah. somebody who can support you. But, um, yeah. So let's talk about change then, because, um, I think it was eight months ago is really when we felt the surge of energy around me too. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and we understand that it's such a needed conversation. It is such a needed conversation. And in no way are myself or any of the men that I feel who are up to good things and are in the conscious space, I guess you could say, mm -hmm. are belittling the Me Too movement. Yet we do see that there is an edge of it where it's actually hurting the dynamic between men and women. Mm -hmm. So what are your thoughts on this? I'd love to kind of wrap our conversation with this because I really wanted to talk to you about this. I posted something on social and I was like, hey, let's turn that M into a W. Mm -hmm. Let's flip it. So instead of it being hashtag me too, which in a way has somewhat of a, of a victimization to it, but yet we also know that there's a side of it that's necessary to be focused on. Mm -hmm. How do we turn that into a W? Gosh. Yeah. It's such a huge question, you know, and, and I'll preface this by saying that um, I have not personally been the victim of any kind of um, sexual assault or anything in my life. So I can't speak to being in that position. I've certainly had moments where I felt perhaps unsafe. Um, I've had moments where I was I received comments from people that I didn't appreciate, um, you know, about my body and and catcalling and and stuff like that. And and so I don't have that. I haven't lived through the absolute devastation that some women have. And so I I. I cannot know what it's like to be in their position and to know the anger that comes with that, the emotion that comes with that and how this movement really took off. And in a lot of ways for women to just finally feel like I've like, I've had enough, like I've had enough of this bullshit and it's time for me to say something. And I, you know, I am going to, um, put this out there so other women feel safe to say that I have been there as well. And I think that there is, and so I, I'm very fledgling in, in learning more about social justice and um, race and, and, and all of these, these issues that are inevitably interwoven, right? This idea of intersectionality. So I'm probably going to mess up in this conversation and um, I'm still very much learning about these things. But I will say is that I know that the one of the the sort of cruxes of the issue comes where it's like, do women 
have to continue to do the emotional labor that is involved to educate men about what is right, what is wrong, why is this wrong? And that in that way, asking women to continue to do that does not respect the position that they've been in, in terms of patriarchy and stuff like that. So that's an aspect of it. And then on the other hand, I do see an opportunity here, and and this is sort of the space I'm in, is like, how can, and Elizabeth D'Alto shared an image on her Instagram the other day that I thought was very powerful. And it was a a woman, you know, an, an an illustration of a woman holding up a sign and it had the male and female symbols. And it said, you know, female greater than male. Fem- like, is this feminism? And then the one below it was like, female equals male. And there was like a man and a woman meeting together in the middle. The, the image on the top was very much like the woman was, it, she looked angry, she was yelling, she like, it just, you know, the, it had the energy of being very, like, we're really pissed off. Um, and the one underneath it was one that was like, let's have a dialogue. And so I think, you know, in a lot of ways, we're in a we're in a time where things are are quite unprecedented. There is, like, you know, social media has opened up the chance to dialogue. But I think I said this to you in this discussion that we, we had on social media, mm-hmm. which was like, when we're having a discussion across a screen and a keyboard, like that can that can help move things forward. Like we might not even... To a point. Yeah, well, yeah. Like let's say we lived in completely different geographical places and we would never have a chance to dialogue about this. I mean, we could get on the phone. Not that people use their phones anymore. (laughs) Um, And how online forums can be a way to sort of find groups and begin conversations. But I feel like now more than ever, things just end up devolving People aren't being understood. They feel like they're not being heard. Uh, it's easy to dominate the conversation. It's easy to gaslight people. Uh, it's easy to shut them down. It's easy to, I mean, you you name it. And so like having a face-to-face conversation, I feel like in a lot of ways is is potentially going to be the way to try to come to a mutual understanding and, and a way to work together. And to see, and, and ultimately, everybody wants to be heard and understood. And I cannot pretend for one second what it's like to be a man right now. Like, and, and this is one of the reasons why I do not tailor my message to men. Men are welcome in my community, for sure. Like, I try, like, to me, health and wellness is not an exclusive thing for women. Uh, if we're talking, even if we're talking about periods and the menstrual cycle, like, men still can be involved in that conversation. <laughs> it's like, still good to know. Their, you know, yeah. husbands, pay, their, their, their dads, their, they have women in their lives. They want to understand it. But I don't speak to what the male experience is because I can't know what that is like. And so I think women feel um, like it's hard to know who to trust because there's not a lot of Di- like again, having these dialogues with people in real life is is difficult sometimes. There's yeah. a lot of, um, you know, fear. Well, at- there's Gretchen Rubin describes it emotional contagion, right? It's mm-hmm. it's almost like any time that any woman's ever been wounded, like Me Too, can be a channel for them to be like, "Yes, I've been wounded," and then pour mm-hmm. that in there, regardless of the severity and different angles of how actually women have been mistreated. Mm-hmm. And I'm talking about just little things. Like as men, I think the challenge is, and I'll just kind of speak for my myself only. The challenge is when I'm a single man and so I'm approaching these women and it's almost like I'm, because I know so much about Me Too and because I have these conversations all the time, I'm really aware, I'm really attuned of how she's feeling. So I'm like taking that responsibility and being like, you know what, I'm going to take ownership of making sure that I'm attuned to how she's feeling. And if no means no, or if I get the wrong vibe, I'll just stop. But I think that attunement process, men aren't being taught that. Mm -hmm. And what a lot of men do is they'll just get angry about it and be like, oh, this Me Too movement is just causing a bunch of women to be pissed off. And like, you know, it's actually just making it so that we can't date and we can't approach women. It's actually not true. Mm -hmm. But it also, and I want to ask you this question, don't you think that it's also the woman's and the way that the man owns the attunement, it's also the woman's role really to be attuned within that herself and to give him the clear signals that it's okay that she likes him i feel like that's really the skill set that men and women together can build 
Yeah, I think for a lot of women, um, and this goes back to sort of what we were talking about in our early conversation about strength training, is that we've just the 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 ways in which we've been told to value ourselves, you know, how we've been seen as having value, um, the beauty industry. I mean, we women receive very mixed messages as well. So being able to then send clear signals and messages out into the world becomes very muddy. Um, and I'm not saying, you know, like if if a woman is like, I'm not interested, that's one thing. But when a woman is unsure of it, will she be seen as and this is the thing I talk about all the time. Women, I feel like they're the double standard is just insane. You're either a slut or you're a prude. You're either a bitch or you're a pushover. You're you're like dumb, right? You're either like you're either too masculine or you're you're you know, you're hyper feminine. Like we can't we just can't win. And this is with women and other men. So women, I feel like the women that I know, even myself as a woman, have had a difficult time understanding, like, how am I supposed to exist in this world, even? Um, Because the messages that we receive from other people are very mixed, right? So if I'm assertive at work, then I'm a bitch, right? But if I don't say anything, then I'm like an airhead, who doesn't know anything, or if I show emotion, we we're talking about this in my Facebook <laughs> Facebook group yesterday. Um, if a man shows emotion, he can. People are like, he's so powerful, he's so self assured, you know. And like, is if a man is impassioned about something, I shouldn't say necessarily emotion, but if a man is impassioned about something, you're gonna get up in a in a room full of people and like give this like rousing speech, and people are gonna be like, oh wow, he cares so much about that thing. And a woman, the edge between being, uh, you know, an emotional wreck, crazy, you know, if she's impassioned, Mm -hmm. is very razor thin. And so I feel like a lot of the times the, it comes down to the mixed messages that we send women about what we value about them. And this impossible Goldilocks standard that we're supposed to maintain, right? We're supposed to be beautiful, but if we're too into ourselves and we're, we're vain, mm-hmm. you know, um, and some of the other examples that I gave, uh, you know, if, if we're almost like too ambitious, then we're seen as too masculine. Um, you know, um, we're not seen as being warm and receptive. And so it, it's, that's part of it. And I think ultimately it comes down to people talking and the problem that we're seeing now in, in just the world in general is like, we have lost the ability we in general um, have lost the ability to just sit down and talk to each other, you know, and I feel like there's, I've seen some good videos on social media recently about, you know, people of different races sitting down and and these were like, you know, they had a, an interaction online that didn't quite go the way either party intended. And then these, these people got together in one room together, person to person, face to face. And it changes the dynamic. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, and Simon Sinek wrote about this in uh, in Leaders Eat Last, and I'm not going to remember the name of the actual phenomenon, but it's basically the more removed from um, seeing someone we are, the more likely we are to treat them as not a, not a human. You know, we become aberrations. We become this image of uh, something that we're really not. And it's easy to go like all of you, you know, all everybody's me too. Like, oh, you're just like, you know, you're just all angry. Or well, like, because it's a clear heuristic. It's just this shortcut to being like, oh, they're in that box. Yeah, so I don't have to spend energy actually learning what it is. Right, and in the and because technology has allowed us to be so anonymous, so um, we don't, we're not sitting together, we're not um, connecting on that level. We become we just become uh, completely inhuman, dehumanized to each other. And it's really easy to hurt people and, uh, and to assume things about them. I want to speak to this because I, I acknowledge what you're saying is total truth. Like it is difficult right now for a woman to just figure out like, what does that actually mean? And I'll tell you, like, it's really challenging for men as well, mm-hmm. especially single men, right? Because for so long, 
women were owned like property. And then for so long, it's like to the degree that a man was like doing and strong and successful and making money, like that's kind of the spear. Tim Ferriss talks about this, mm -hmm. like money has become a man's spear. Mm -hmm. And so we have all these fucked up ways in which men are valued in this society. And I think that is the toxicity mm -hmm. that really like, I'm here to help lessen. Yeah. And I know you are. So for the men and women listening, like mm -hmm. we can have this conversation all afternoon. <laughs> so wh where can they go inside themselves? What is one step mm -hmm. that a man can do to address flipping the M to a W? And what mm -hmm. is one step that a woman can do to doing the same thing? listening, being willing to listen. And this is what I'm learning as I dig into social justice stuff and intersectionality and learning about my own racism and learning about my own privilege and learning about my feminism and like all of these things is, is like, we need to stop. We need to start listening to each other, not just listening, but hearing each other. And when we can't even sit down to listen and hear the other person and and we live in a very like reactive society a lot of us have been taught like we need to fix these problems so we want to go to work right away or we just want to like things to be better um but part of it is not being willing to sit down and really hear the other person and it's like everybody just wants to be heard but as soon as we sit down and we're like, I want to be dominating you and I'm going to tell you how it is, it, believing someone's experience. When, they, when you tell me, it's really hard as a single man to know how to approach this. It's a rocky road sometimes. And it's is, not victimization. It's more like just perspective. Mm -hmm. It's like part of what I can do is to believe your, your experience and to... In, in my heart, acknowledge that and vice versa, you know, and, and I think that that if we're unwilling to do that, and I think this is what happens online is like we just get into like flame wars and like it's easy to hide. It's easy to hide, but it's easy to just vomit what you want to say and run away yep. and to um, to not hold space for that person to not believe their experience and try to automatically invalidate their experience by like, well, but, you know. And that may not be your personal experience, but to to completely, you know, to say things that and then invalidate that person's experience. I mean, that is dehumanizing. And I feel like that's where all communication completely crumbles <coughs> right from the outset. And so is to, you know, if if you do want to get involved in in having these greater conversations is to amplify the voices of, you know, people who you believe are have something valuable to say in terms of women who are doing the work that you believe in, like amplifying their voices, uh, women who are coming to the table and saying, like, I want to learn how to repair this relationship between men and women. And this is what I'm doing in my own way. Um, you know, for me in, in sort of in the fitness and health spaces, trying to do better to amplify the voices of women of color in this space you know, and so it's more of like, can we put our ego aside <laughs> and give people that chance to to speak and listen to them and hear them out? And and when we don't, and we just are like, but that's not what I that you're wrong. That's not what I experienced. That's not how I see it. Like, then I mean, the wall has has gone up, and and I don't know how we can get over that. So you know, it comes down to basic communication. Yeah. And I love that you said like it's about the listening, but it, listening is a skill set. Mm -hmm. Like most most podcasts that I've been on, I'm sure you can attest to this. Like I almost have felt sometimes that the host is just like get ready to the next question, and it's like this connectivity. It's an art form that I think is declining because of this thing on the mm -hmm. counter, which is the phone. Mm -hmm. And so this is one of my last questions for you today. It's like how do we in this world of having the world in our hand mm -hmm. through a phone? How do we practice this art of talking, this mm -hmm. art of communication? Do you schedule in the calendar? <laughs> do you make play dates with adults? Like, mm -hmm. where do we go as a man and woman together collective to allow this to unfold so that honestly, we're not a victim to this phone because it's like kind of freaking me out lately? Yeah, it is. It freaks me out too. And, you know, <sighs> having relationships with people takes work, it always has. And this goes for platonic relationships, friendships, romantic relationships. I get annoyed 
sort of at people who are like, uh, you know, I don't like it when people call me. Don't call me. I don't want to talk to anyone. And I'm just sort of like, what pain are you dealing with right now? Because that sounds like a really crappy place to be and to be like, I don't even want to hear from my friends or my family. And I get it. Like, sometimes it's not convenient. There's this really great uh, sketch comic on um, uh, the video I've seen on on YouTube. And he's like, you know, I grew up in an Italian family. And it used to be like, oh, everybody's coming over. We're gonna it's like a Jersey. My Jersey accent isn't very good. Like, we're all gonna come over. Like, oh, I used to be like, break out the best. You know, we're gonna make coffee and break out the Chianti on the table. Yeah, like, uh, grandma's gonna bake a cake and like all this (laughs) stuff. And like, oh, everybody got excited. And now the scenario is uh, someone knocks on your door, and the lights go off and you all hide. You know, um, and so that's sort of the the dynamic that exists in our world now is like it, connecting with people has become it's become something we can opt out of, and so it's like which came first, the chicken or the egg? Did we start opting out because we could, or were are we just overwhelmed? Um, has the tool enabled us to to opt out more? And so um, I don't know. To me, one of the simplest things that I've started doing, and I got this idea from Jill Coleman. Um, she was like, I try to leave people voice texts. I've been doing this, like walkie-talkie yeah, talkie messages. Yeah, and yeah. so I've been doing this more, more with my friends because it just adds, it, it does a, it does add that level of connection. I have left you a couple of those. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and I really like that as a way, first of all, it's way easier than texting. It's so much faster. I know. Um, Plus, don't text and drive. If you're driving right now, stop it. Yeah, no texting and driving. So I feel like... Um, that that's a way that you can take a baby step, right? Or use Voxer or something like that. Um, beyond that, I really do think it takes discipline because we get so much dopamine from our phones and it's like the, it's such cheap, <laughs> it's such a cheap hit. It's so digital need, junk food. So, oh, it totally is digital junk food. And we need, um, you know, we need more and more of it to get the same response and stuff. And so I, I just think some people, myself included, it's all about boundaries, setting boundaries. And so, for example, for some people, it's like my phone lives on the technology table. Like, you know, we've got like Wi-Fi in an airport extreme and whatever. That's where the phone lives. And if I want to go use the phone, I have to go to it. For some people, it is scheduling. Um, if you're, you know, an entrepreneur and you, you're you handling your own social media, it's like scheduling t- an hour a day where you do your social media that doesn't work for me. I don't do that. But I'm saying this has worked for some people that I talk to. Yeah. Definitely taking your phone out of your bedroom and sleeping with it in the other room. And some people are like, but I need to be able to get calls. And I'm like, put it, then get it off your nightstand at least. You know, Buy an old school alarm clock. An old school, an old school alarm clock. Yeah. Um, some people need to be on call. And I'm like, can you put it, you know, do you have a, a bathroom that's nearby? You can put it on the, the, you know, the counter in the bathroom. And still hear the alarm go off. Or do your room have no technology where you sleep? Yes. Okay. No technology at all. So we um, charge our phones, you know, right over here. No phones in the bedroom. No TV in the bedroom. We don't even have a TV. But uh, you know, I think the more we we have to take steps to to literally like set those boundaries in in the way that makes sense for us. And for some people, that's going to be completely a baby steps process. Um, I know, you know, some people, it really works for them when they go out to eat and they're like, oh, first person to pull out their phone. Hey, stack the phones on the Um, table. Brene Brown had a uh, post she put up yesterday. I guess it was when her daughter turned 13 and it was like a basket of phones and everybody put their, all the kids came and put their phones in a basket. And it was like, you know, it's getting to the point where because these things are extensions of, of us now, um, and they're so convenient and it's like really having to, to wind the clock back in those ways and, uh, and, and trying to like connect because it is so, um, it's so insidious in, in yeah. how it takes over. Wow, Steph, this has been like a two hour conversation, <laughs> which I didn't plan on talking to you for two hours, <laughs> but like it's unfolded so organically and so fun with you. Um, Thanks. and I think this is why people connect with you. This is why the time I had lunch with you, I was like, she's just so easy to like sit next to. And I, and I feel that from you. And the last two questions mm-hmm. um, that I always ask people, but I want to ask you them in a different way. Okay. The first one is around this emotional and physical intelligence. It's this intersection that we live at. What is something emotionally uh, from an education or intelligence perspective that you're leaning into 
right? In other words, is there a practice of emotional intelligence that you're currently kind of like looking at and allowing to soak in? Hmm. For me, it's um, the thing that's been on my mind a lot more lately is meeting, seeing people with more compassion for where they're at. And some of that comes back to compassion for self, right? Because if I can't see it, uh, if I if I can't see it in other people, I'm not going to be able to see it in myself. But giving people the benefit of the doubt more often than not. And I read this, I read the book Self Compassion by Kristen Neff not too long ago. And she sort of gives this example of like, when you see, you know, here in San Diego, we have a lot of transient folks. We have a lot of homeless people because of the, the climate and stuff in our neighborhood. We have a lot of homeless folks. And it's like, when I walk by that homeless person, you know, what is my thought about them? If I see, you know, if I go to the mall and I see somebody, you know, trying to collect money, you know, what is, what do I think about them? What, how do I see them? Um, what's the story I make up in my head about that person? And more often than not, I, I'm trying, this is a practice, but trying to see people more from that place of compassion, not knowing what they've gone through to get to that point, what they're struggling with. And we all have the things that we're struggling with. And I think, again, it's really easy to dehumanize people. Um, so I would say that that's, that's something that I'm you know, trying to do a lot more to reserve judgment. Do you feel like empathy is still a skill set that you're growing? Oh, for sure. Yeah, for sure. And it's hard in 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 like nutrition and and fitness and stuff because so many people are like this is, you know, um this is what I want to do and this is the right way and I walk a fine line. And I'm like, okay, as a as a nutrition professional, what I see you engaging in is potentially harmful for you. On the other hand, I have to try to honor your journey as unfolding in the way it needs to unfold and I can't live your life for you and so can I again um, hold space for you to make your mistakes and that is something that I'm really working on and not going to judgment not not going to judgment or not going right into like I want to fix everything about you and I want to help people absolutely but is you know what is my job how do I uh, compartmentalize and as somebody who's empathic and, and HSP like how do I not soak up everybody else's problems and make them my own and how do I respect my own energy and my own boundaries so that's all kind of like going into it because my first thing is like I just want to help you I just want to fix what's wrong I can I have the answer right and and as a coach certainly we have knowledge but this goes back to like listening and um, allowing people to the space to to make the mistake because the mistakes sometimes are just as powerful as the knowledge is in them figuring things out. Mm. And so when somebody's deep in the struggle, and I see this a lot in my community, is like somebody's deep in the nutrition struggle, deep in the struggle about getting their fitness back on track, deep in the self the self talk struggle, whatever it is, is like. Uh, can I can I ask the right questions? Can I plant the seed, but respecting my own energy as well to go like you can't fix everybody, you can't fix five thousand people, you mm. can't fix two hundred thousand people. This is so big, and I know you've probably heard of her, and I think she'd be an incredibly powerful guest for your show. Her name's Christine Hassler. She mm-hmm. has the Over and On with It podcast. Mm. Have you interviewed her before? I haven't, but I've heard of her. Oh my god! So she has this this quote, and it's like. Do yourself the honor of not robbing someone of their process. Don't allow somebody to shorten their processing, which Mm -hmm. they're going to earn as almost like an internal strength marker by you wanting to fix them. Yeah. That is going to be the number one thing that actually robs somebody of the growth they deserve. Do you know about motivational interviewing? Um, I know about inspiring interviewing. (laughs) (laughs) So motivational interviewing is, is a, is a process of, of, learning to talk with a, a client or somebody who you potentially Oh like getting um, them on a yes ladder or something. Um yeah, similar to that. Like yeah. listening again, listening for for change talk and um and things like that. But one of the things that we that they talk about is resisting the writing the writing, R I G H T, the writing reflex, which is like the reflex like, oh I just but I, I can I can know the answer. I can help you. I can I know what, what the right thing is gonna oh, be for yeah. you. Right. The 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 first instinct that a lot of people in our coaches and and, um, 
things like that in the coaching profession and the teaching profession want to default to, which is like, I just want to make everything right for you. And so that that came to mind as you were saying mm. that as well. And so that's been an, an area that I've been trying to set more boundaries with too, because yeah. it is a way that I very easily overextend myself with folks is over teaching and over too, giving too much information. And Healthy boundaries. It's honestly the only way that we can be harder to kill because if we're taking on people's energy, we're going to be freaking exhausted. Yeah. All the time. Last last question. Harder to Kill, you started it three plus five plus years ago, right? This theme of this. What does that mean to you now? What exactly does that mean to you today (laughs) compared to when you started? Oh, it's such a good question. And I was talking to my my editors last week, and this is one of the questions that Sydney asked me. And she's like, you know, tell me about Harder to Kill. Like, what what does that mean? And like, how do you define it? And to me, you know, at at the beginning, it started off a little bit more meaning, uh, you know, being physically robust and and strong and all that stuff. And over time, you know, to me, it 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 really means like what are the ways that we're resilient, not just physically resilient. Are we emotionally resilient? Are we spiritually resilient? Are we mentally resilient? And so, you know, sometimes the word kill is very loaded for people. Um, And and so we talked about this, my editors and I, like, how are, you know, we, how are we going to, like, what's the manifesto about this? And like, what does it mean to you? And I'm like, well, I mean, I think it means different things to different people and people are going to take away from it what they need at the moment. But it's really about this idea of resiliency uh, being anti-fragile, if you know anything about anti- anti-fragility, mm-hmm. you know, not only being able to be strong when things are great, but when things are hard and things are challenging, how do we react to that? I mean, certainly feel the feels and process the emotions, but what do, what do we do with that as a result? And, and how do we use that as a potential for transformation? And I think that for me, um, harder to kill encompasses all of those different those different things and how we help people um practice the skills because so many times I think folks are like oh I either know this or I don't or how am I ever going to be good at this and it's like you show up you give it your best some days you're not going to have it all figured out you give yourself the grace to make mistakes and um you know, step away when you need to step away, but to continue to come back to that process and to continue to engage and to continue to explore. And I think for me, um, learning and and being a learner of, of all different things in life, like I really believe the minute we stop learning, we just, we stop thriving. Totally. And, and so it's like, can we stay open to new things? Can we listen? Can we engage people with different perspectives than ours and you know getting older again I think this is a a function of that but it's like I don't know anything about the world and I (laughs) very like the more I do this I'm like I don't know anything um can we be open to that yeah can we um can we continue to unfold in our own way or do we become stuck do we become stifled so it sort of means all of those things that ultimately, ultimately comes down to flexibility and, and resiliency. What's up with the new book? Can you tell us the title? Is it secret? Um, the working title is The Harder to Kill Handbook. Ah. So okay. I don't know if it'll stay that way. You know, there's a lot that goes into naming a book. but uh, That's a cool, what's it called? Alliteration when things rhyme. Yeah. It's a cool alliteration. Yeah. So um, it's about the four pillars that I teach in my program. The four pillars that make up my you know yeah. philosophy of how I see the world. And um, it's going to be good. Where can people soak up more of you right now? And how is that going to change? <laughs> so right now you can go to stupideasypaleo.com and everything that I do is linked from there. The podcast, Harder to Kill Radio, all the social stuff. Um, in the fall, it's going to turn into stephgodro.com. But if you go to any Stupid Easy Paleo URL or you type that in, it'll be redirected. So That must have been a beast. Oh, uh, we're st- well. We're in the process okay. right now. Yeah, we're, we're in the soup of that. It's and like so- hand check every link. <laughs> well, that's what it's going to be. <laughs> yeah, and it's uh, it's a, it's an amazing process. It's an amazing opportunity. You know, and the, you know, we're talking about like emotional, um, intelligence and stuff like that. And the thing I'm learning a lot right now is to, uh, just be okay with what is. You know, so 
I got this tooth pulled a couple weeks ago and everybody's like, aren't you freaking out about it? Like you have no tooth there. It's right in the front. It looks, you know, can you talk? Like, does it hurt? What do you feel about the process? People, you know, like, are you upset about it? And I'm like, what is there to be upset about? It is what it is. It is what it is, man. You uh-huh. know, like, yeah. do I do I want to spend my fucks caring about this thing, like, and getting mad a bit and angry about it? I'm not necessarily, like, it, I knew it was going to happen for, like, 15 years that this was an inevitability. But the same thing with the website. I look at that, some of that stuff, and we've got some, like, really, whoo, like, I didn't know anything about SEO and blogging and optimizing content and all this stuff. And I, I think back, and I'm like, part of me says, wow, I wish I knew that stuff seven years ago. And I'm like, wait a minute, but if I knew that stuff and I was like, I've got to do all these things, I probably would have been overwhelmed. I was overwhelmed as it was, but, yeah. you know, and so I see this opportunity of going back and looking at old content and, and you know, part of me is like, oh my God, this is such crap. <laughs> but it's a cool uh, way to reflect on on where you've come from and it where is. you're going. It is a cool way. And then I go, yeah, it is what it is. And, 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 yeah, you know, Gary Vaynerchuk, uh, is somebody that I, I loosely follow. I find, I, I would love to talk to him someday, but I got um, to ask him a question last month in person. Yeah, I saw that. Sometimes, oh, cool. sometimes he's, uh, he, his energy is a little intense for me as an HSP, but I really like something he posted the other day. Um, and he was like, you know, in terms of entrepreneurs, like you chose this. You did. Like, there's going to be things that come up that are part of this because you chose it. And, you know, I think things happen to us sometimes that we don't choose. But I think in terms of the whole journey and the fact that, like, teaching was very predictable, like, there was paycheck every two weeks. It was comfortable at, you know, 12 years in. But it had its pain as well. Either path, there's pain. There is pain. And it's like, you you know, remembering that that it was the path that I that I chose for, you know, I chose that. I chose this. And it's just like, well, are you going to complain about it and be upset about it? Or are you just going to deal with things? I think, you know, um, when it comes to the website and all that stuff, I'm like, well, I mean, we just we just got to do it. <laughs> just got to do it. Sitting with you today, I just want to say, fuck yeah. This was so <laughs> fun. And um, people are going to dig in. We're going to talk Thanks. about this a lot in the Wellness Force group. Sweet. Um, I'll add you there. And people can also go to your group. It's over 5,000 people. I just joined yeah. it this morning. Yeah. What's, what's the name of the group? Harder to Kill Club. Harder to Kill Club. You guys, look at Steph's work. It's been a joy to sit with you in your home here. And honestly, I just want to acknowledge the voice of truth that you have. Like you speak your truth, even if it shakes. And that's a platitude. But like you still do the damn thing. So thanks for being this powerful feminine force that people can learn from. And also, thanks for being so open and authentic about your imperfectness on the way. (laughs) It's been really cool to sit with you, Steph. Thanks. Thanks, Josh. Hey, my friend. Thank you for hanging out and growing with me on today's show. Remember to hit subscribe, share this podcast with somebody you care about that you think gets to hear this message. Support the show by leaving a five-star review for the podcast right now simply by tapping on your show artwork on your iPhone. Click that purple link that says review this podcast. It helps the show reach more conscious and smart people like you and your voice will attract more world-class guests that want to come on the show. So let them hear your voice. For all the downloads, videos, links, and free resources mentioned on the episode, go to wellnessforce.com forward slash radio. And while you're at my house on the web, join us in the Wellness Force community newsletter on that page and I'll send you four free guides around staying healthy with your eating, moving, and sleeping while you travel. But don't let this conversation stop here. Join a group of people like you over at the Wellness Force community Facebook page. This is where we talk about the things that really matter. We share our wins, inspirations, struggles, and a lot more. So join us, tap on the show artwork on your phone and hit that purple link that says join the Facebook group and I will welcome you at the door. Okay, now you get to go out into your world and create impact for the people that you care about. So until I see you again real soon, I'm wishing you love and wellness.